Last Sunday we started a series entitled More. Can you say that with me? More. More. We looked at the prayer of Jabez and as we looked at the prayer of Jabez, we noticed that Jabez prayed, bless me indeed. He prayed, enlarge my territory. He prayed, your hand be upon me. He prayed, keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. The prayer of Jabez is found in the book of First Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. What a tremendous passage, what a tremendous lesson that we have truly learned from that prayer. Today we continue the more series and we'll be having a look at more of God. Can you turn and tell your neighbor, more of God. You need more of God. Thank you, Lord. Let me be sure to say to you, God wants us to have more. God wants us to have more. Over the years, the Christian church has wrestled with various things. And at one point in time, the church seemed to have felt that if you are blessed with this world's material possessions, that things were not so great for you as a believer. We seem to have believed at one point in time that we could have been distracted by the material possessions and it seemed to have been felt by some people that God didn't really want us to have much material possessions so that we would not be distracted by it. It would almost seem as if having an abundance of possessions was somehow from the devil. And so when people were, were blessed with this world's goods, as believers, we seem to think that something was wrong with their life and didn't feel that we could have had both God and the material possessions at the same time. Recently, I was in a meeting and I listened to a fellow minister and he spoke about how things were at the time that he was saved a number of years ago and the, the kind of thinking that he had, that we had as believers. And he said, in those days, we felt that having less was better. That was a prevailing view of the Christian church in this land. That somehow the less we have, the better we are at being Christians and believers. We need to have a look at that again. We seem to be, believe that we need to glorify poverty. That the poorer we were, the more holy we were. There is no connection between poverty and holiness. They are two completely different, separate, and unrelated matters. I am happy to share with you today that as we continually gain a better and better understanding of God individually and of God's word, we declare that we know that God wants us to have more. Somebody say more. I can confidently declare to you that God wants you to have more. While extremes are usually to be avoided, typically when we go to an extreme in any given thing, we run the risk of ending up in problems. We want to be clear to understand that a healthy, balanced life is a place that we need to aim for. We don't want to be focused all on material possessions because you may miss them. If we go across it now and focus all on God, we're going to miss a whole bunch of things, including relationships with people. It is strange to say that you might be praying too much. Is anyone in danger of that? That's a danger we can have, right? Here, here's an interesting example of it. While I was at Bible school, one of my fellow students, he was in the year after me, one, one year after. While I was there, we would chat often and I would often drop him home after school. And I noted that he was having problems with some things. And we had a brief conversation and I inquired, what's going on with you? Why is it that you, you seem to be so tired and you can't stay up in class and so on? And he confided in me that he was up all night praying and that was a regular activity of his. I think I smiled but helped him to understand that you're praying too much brother. 
What you need to do is sleep. Get some good rest. So the next day, you can be awake and fresh and go to class and receive and take it. There is always a place for us to pray a lot. But we need to balance that out with living our daily life. Amen? So we aiming to have a, a healthy balance and understanding that there is a need for us to have material possessions in our life. And there is a need for us to serve God with our whole mind and whole heart. Let me say to you clearly that wealth and possessions are not of the devil. Say it again. Wealth and possessions are not of the devil. That is not a trick of the enemy to give you plenty so that you wouldn't serve God. That's not of the devil. How we manage our possessions becomes the really important thing. God has no problem with wealth and possessions. None whatsoever. We have a problem when we have some things. Some people get a little thing. They begin to get a little blessing, a little material this, a little material that. And all of a sudden their Christian life seems to get flipped upside down. They are having a problem dealing with that. God knows what you can have. As we survey the scripture, we come across several people in scripture who were fantastically blessed and these were all servants of God. But let me share with you a couple of them. Abraham. It is said in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 14 that Abraham was able to raise a squad of 318 trained young men from his own house. If anybody have 318 young men working in their household, that person is not poor. That person has wealth. To require 318 young men, this is not everybody. When the scripture says from his own household, it meant the servants who work in his house. These are people who were born in his house. They were born and raised there. That means that their parents are also part of the household. That means that their siblings are also part of the household. How many servants did Abraham have? Fabulously wealthy man. When they raised that school and they went to get back Lot, because Lot and a few other people in the city were taken captive. When they raised the school and they went and got back Lot and defeated the enemy, the king of Sodom offered Abraham, said, Thank you, we'll take the people, you take the possessions. And Abraham said, in our language, I don't want anything. Abraham went on to say, I don't want anybody to say that they made me rich. God is the one who's doing that. Abraham didn't take anything. Abraham was a fabulous leader to them. Solomon, the personal fortune, of King Solomon has been reported to be somewhere in the range of over two trillion with a T, trillion US dollars in today's money. One more. We think we know that Solomon was rich. When we start putting that into today's terms, then we realize exactly how much money this man. In one occasion, he received an amazing amount of gold. And the scripture was careful to say, this is just from this. This is not from people passing by and paying taxes and so on. Solomon was a fabulously wealthy man. And God had no difficulty giving that to him. In the New Testament, we meet Joseph of Arimathea. In Matthew 27, 59 and 60, let us know that Joseph of Arimathea, prepared for his own funeral. He had a tomb that was cut out in the rock, ready for when he passed away. He had already made arrangements for his own funeral, and when Jesus died, he put the body of Jesus in his own tomb. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. We read the gospel in the book of Acts, chapter 8. 
In Acts chapter 8, we meet Philip, and Philip meets a eunuch. In verse 27, we learn who this man was. This Ethiopian eunuch was the treasurer of Ethiopia. And he had come to Jerusalem, and he was now on his way back home, and he was reading the word. He was in fact reading the book of Isaiah, and he did not understand what he was reading. So Philip came in, helped him with his understanding, and then the Ethiopian, you know, asked him to baptize him one time, and Philip baptized him one time. The Ethiopian, you know, was responsible for a large amount of money. When you are responsible for a large amount of money, you are not a poor man. God has no difficulty with wealth and possessions. We need to make sure that we are able to handle God blessing us with that. God wants us to have, to have a balanced life. Here is what the word says in, 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 first, in first John, sorry, two. Phil John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health. How? Just as your soul prospers. God wants us to prosper. God wants us to advance. We need to keep our head screwed on correctly. So we're not taken away and leaned aside by these things. The Bible says, of course, the love of money is the root of all evil. The Bible never says to us that the money is the root of all evil. When we can't contain our passions, we are going to end up in problems. God wants you to have more. Having more is important. And there are several benefits to it. Let's look at two categories of the benefits of, the, of, of having more. Let's look first at the personal benefits. If you have more, here is how this can benefit you. You can meet your needs without problems. Would you like tomorrow to be able to handle your needs? You need to pay a bill. You need to buy a shoe. You need to, to pay off this loan. You need to, to take a trip down the road to organize this. To handle your needs and you don't have to worry about anything. As one person said, go to the electricity company and pay a bill. Pre-pay a bill for the year and tell them, here's your money, leave me alone. Tell Tia Tech, look the money, leave me alone. When that money runs out, then tell me. When you, are, when you have more, your personal benefit is the fact that you can give to others and not expecting anything in return. Notice I said, give, not lend. Two completely different things. I may be, I may have enough to lend you a 500, but when Montel reach, uh, you need to bring back the money because I have things to do, right? That's if I lend you. If you need a 500, I dip and I say, here's your 500. Be blessed. Go your way. Go on handle your business. I'm not expecting anything from you. If you bring it back for me, I will tell you. That is for you. Keep that. Go ahead. Be blessed. When you have more, you have the personal benefit of being able to do the things that you always wanted. Not me, did Wanted to do. Take 10 seconds and think about some of the things that you have wanted to do. 4, 3, 2, 1. Anybody wanted to go on a cruise? You wanted to change your whole wardrobe next month. Yeah? You wanted to be able to, to, to sponsor a whole orphanage just to bless them, feed them for a month. You want, there are several things that you want to do, but you can't do it. Why you can't do it? You don't have enough to do this. But when you have more, one of the benefits is that you can do the things that you wanted to do. You can afford to have the things you always wanted to have. You don't need a red Ferrari, but you want a red Ferrari. And you can afford to pay for a red Ferrari, amen? That bag that costs 1500 US, amen sisters? 
that you see and you get weak in your knees when you just think about your bag. You can afford to buy the bag because it's something that you want. You can have it because you want it. When you have more in your life, you have the opportunity and the ability to acquire those things. When you have more, you can provide adequately for your family in the way that you want to do, but you can't do because you don't have enough. Personal benefits of being able, of having more. Being able to do things that you need to do and doing things that you simply want to do. Here's the next category. Kingdom. So there's your personal benefits and then there is a kingdom benefit. You see, because you are in the kingdom and you have more, guess what? The kingdom gets the benefit because you now have more. You can finance the kingdom. Finance the kingdom. There is a need to do this, that, or the other. But because there's more in your life, you can simply do it. If the church needs a new projector, you can finance that. Come, come, come quietly and outside and say, Pastor, I'll take care of that. End of story. Yes. The church needs to, to do these particular activities and you can say, I will take care of that. The finance the kingdom. You may not be able to go or you may not desire to go, but there are several people who want to leave their shores and go to another culture, a place where people are not receiving the word and they want to go, but they don't have funds. You don't want to go, but you can afford to send someone, kingdom benefit. I saw a small, a small piece of, of uh, a show earlier this morning that shared with us a very startling fact that Japan, a developed nation of Japan, is one of the least Christian nations in the whole world and they're open to missionaries. So maybe somebody wants to contact the Japanese embassy and learn Japanese and then go and go serve as a missionary in Japan or you want to go and teach English and you can afford to sponsor them because you can finance the kingdom. You can be a walking, living, breathing testimony of God's goodness simply because you have more in your life. When you speak about the fact that you serve a big God and you can demonstrate this is one of the ways that God is big, people see that all the time. When you give into the kingdom so that the kingdom can benefit from that, you know what happens? You in return are blessed because you have given. Ever realize that there seems to be a principle? The people who have plenty seem to get even more plenty. Yep. And the people who have little sometimes seem to be getting even more little. Yes. So you can get, listen to the, the principle of sowing and reaping. If you reap, if you sow a little, can you expect an abundant harvest? You will get a return, but the return is going to be small. Yes, yes, it is what the word of God says. Second Corinthians 9 and chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. If you sow sparingly, you are going to reap sparingly. Give. And when you have more in your life, you can afford to do what? To give more finance the kingdom. That will be taken and used and blessed and benefit the lives of many, many people. God wants you to have. God wants you to have more. When we consider being able to get more, there are basically two ways that we can go about having more. One is the world's way, and the other one is God's way. Let's look at the world's way. The world's way is based on hard work. It has been said that hard work is not contagious. People will sit there, relax, and watch you 
work and sweat and feel no compulsion to help Hard work. The world's way based on one, hard work. Two, smarts. How smart are you? You notice that there are some people who, who are smart intellectually. They know a lot of facts and have a lot of book knowledge so they can, they can pass exams and land nice jobs and so on. There are people who have a different kind of smart. We're not talking about the, about the tricky smart like, like, like we have. Another kind of smart can be described as a, another word. Acumen. Business acumen in particular. There are some people who just know how to do business. You give them a hundred dollars and before you turn around, they have five hundred dollars in their hand. And they didn't go and play, play. They know how to handle money. They have business acumen. They are relying on their ability. The world's way is also based on deceit. People will deceive you. They will lie to you. They will cheat you. You will have a signed contract with them and they will do everything possible to undermine that contract. I notice that you pay insurance for your car. It's typically paid once a year at the start of that year of coverage. And during that year, if you should get into an accident and you go to the insurance company and you say to them, I want now to lay a claim against the insurance that I have with you, you notice that it's all in a rigmarole and drama. They really serious in terms of you paying, you in Kenya, they will make you pay. But when it's time for them to pay, is a different matter. You have paid your premium already. It costs you $4,000 to cover, cover the insurance for your car. You have paid the premium already. And then they will tell you that if you are, you are laying a claim, making a claim against your policy, the excess is $2,500. They have just extorted $2,500 from you. And there's little you can do about it. And then you present the estimate for the insurance company. You went to the mechanic and you present the estimate. It will cost $15,000 to repair the car and bring it back how it's supposed to be. They will look at that, they will take it to their people, they will send a valuator, they will look at it, consider, and then they will cut that $15,000 and bring it down. The $10,000 and $12,000. They're not giving up the money. You think that it's easy. No. They will do that to you. And a lot of things, final thing, a lot of us in this country have and like to use this world's way of getting forward and getting more is based on connections. Who you know. You want to get something, you want to do something. People will often ask, who I know who will get their boy? Who I know who can give me this boy? Yeah, not for the system. Undermine the system by slipping in through the side door. This world system is based upon hard work, smarts, deceit, connections, etc. God's way is entirely different. God's way involves hard work. You need to work. What did God say to Adam? By the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. The land will bring forth thorns and thistles. By the sweat of your you need to work. Hence the Apostle Paul says, if a man would work, then he should eat. Work. God expects us to work. But it's not based upon that only or the other things that you work. God's way forward and having more is also based upon godly favor. You walk into the place, you stand there waiting patiently in line, and then somebody who you don't know comes to you and says to you, come please. And then gives you priority access and then opens doors that you didn't even think would have been possible because the favor of God is upon you. That's one of the ways that God ensures that we get more. Another way is that we get godly ideas. Folks, we can have ideas, we can have good ideas, we can have great ideas, but there's no idea like a God idea. Whole different scene. That is the kind of ideas we want to have. We want to have God ideas. Ideas that come to us sometimes in the middle of the night. Revelation from God. You need to do this. Try this. God ideas. God will do that for us. God's way of giving us more is by giving us 
godly inspiration. God is the one who's breathing the stuff on us. Godly revelation. Here's a very interesting thing. God is able to show you what to do and how to do it. So here's the question. Who knows more about how to have more? You or God? Who is supposed to be to get your ideas from? God. The Bible says to us concerning having more in God's way, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers. The, the old English King James says to us, the power to create wealth. One of the ways that that often happens is by God showing us what to do and giving us God ideas. This is what you need to do. Sometimes those things are counterintuitive, they make no sense to you. It is not your place to question God. Once you know God is the one who says to do this, that, or the other, it don't matter what your rational mind says, go on and do it, please. Because God is trying to make a way for you to have more. Say it with me, God wants you to have more. Having more, we need to recognize what our source is. We sometimes feel that our source is the job. We sometimes feel that the source is uh, when we when we get an income tax return check from the government. Yeah. We sometimes feel that the government is the source because we want to, to work a little 10 days here, a little this, a little that. And we look to the government for that. We look to the employer for that. We look to the boss for that. Some of us look to the church for that. But be assured, God is the source of all things. The source. He it is full supply. God may use other people to get more to us, but it is only coming through them. It is coming from God. So we need to look to Him that He is able to do it. Here's how much He's able to do it. Psalm 24 and verse 1. God is the source, says to us, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Psalm chapter 50 and verse 10 says to us, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Exactly how much cattle can we put on one hill? And then extrapolate that and say, Well, if we put this much cattle on one hill, and he owns the cattle upon a thousand hills, just how much cattle does he own? We think about ranchers, some of us would have grown up looking at westerns. And we see that talk about 50,000 head of cattle. Folks, small thing. One rancher, 50,000, small thing. There's one rancher. That rancher cattle is not his own, it's God's. Consider all the ranchers across the whole world. How much cattle does God have? And the beasts of the forest and the cattle upon it all is just a metaphor to demonstrate and say to us, God owns all of this. He is the owner. Our Father owns it all and He desires to give us. God is our source. Here is an important principle I want us to be sure to have. Write this down, remember it, record it, do what you need to do to have this. If we have God, we will have access to all that is. The church is what? The bride of Christ, yeah? What is it that the wise normally say? She will say to the husband, Yours is mine. And mine is mine. She doesn't say mine is yours. She said mine is mine. The bride gets a significant benefit. Consider this also. If 
a person, a man, but before God, there is a version of the wedding vow that goes like this. The man is the one who says it, right? All my possessions I give to thee. There's a version of the wedding vow that actually says that. The man pledges to give all to his bride all that he has. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The Father is very willing to do it. Jesus, our King, our Lord, our bridegroom, is willing to give up to us, the church, his bride, what he has. Consider this. A man owns a mango farm. He has all kind of mango. He has calabash, he has julie, he has doodles, he has starch, he has long mango, he has graham. All possible kind of mango he has in the mango farm. This is his business. He hires people to plant and pick the mango, process the mango, and sell, and brings in a lot of money. He lives this way. He owns a mango farm. We will notice that his children can go into the mango farm, walk through the farm, and freely pick any fruit that they want. Sit down and eat mango till the belly want the bus. No problem. None of the workers will chastise each other. None of the workers will say to the child, you can't pick that. Why? Because all that child needs to say, this is my father's father. These are my father's because the farm is owned by the man. The man's child can go and freely pick of the produce because that is your father. Our father owns it all. Owns it all. And he wants us to be able to have access to what he owns. He owns it and he desires to give to us. But there is a problem. If it were just like that, all believers would be well. So here's a good question. How is it that there are some people who seem to be so fabulously spiritually rich? They are spiritually high, they're giants, but they are financially poor. See that? They know God. Them people can pray. They walk next to you and you feel the presence of God in their lives. And somehow they can't see their way financially. That often happens because there are some things that they don't know and some things that they are not applying. Some people may be of the view that I cannot be a great spiritual giant and have wealth and material possessions at the same time. And they are wrong. If their thinking is that I can't have both at the same time, then they will walk in poverty. So consider this fact. There is a problem that we experience today. We've experienced this problem for a long time. We sometimes as believers, children of the most high God, behave like children of wealthy parents. And they only relate to their parents when they want to get some money. But they have no real relationship with their parents. They only visit when they want something. But they don't talk to their parents about how their day was. They don't share with them what is happening in their day to day lives. They don't call them and say, Mom, Dad, I just wanted to say I love you. I want you to make sure you know that I love you. We don't do that. Every time the wealthy parent sees the child coming, or sees the, 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 the phone ID and recognizes this is the child, they dread the call or the visit because they know that child coming to ask them for something. That is not the way to have a relationship with them. When we reduce God to just being the person 
that we get things from her. That is exactly what we do. God is not our personal ATM. We are not to go to God when I want this or I need that. That is the time we go to God. What about the times when we simply go to God and say, God, I love you, I bless you. I didn't come to ask you for anything. I just want to, I just want to love you. I just want to bask in your presence of it. I just want to give you the praise and the glory. We, we, we don't only go to him when we want something. We be with him all of the time. When we behave like the children who only go to the parents when they want something, we are making the cardinal error that several people make. We seek his hand, but not his face. His hand represents his favor, the things he can do for us. His face represents him. Many of us have friends, either in our lives now or have had at some point in time. Them people are leeches. They only hang around you to get from you. They don't contribute to your life. When you have, they're all around you. When you don't have and you need, you can't see none of them. That's not how we have relationships. The kind of relationship that we need to have, God is one that is with a loving Father that we are pleased to go to. To go up at the end of the day and just say, Daddy, this is what happened today. God saw all of it, He knows. But oh, how God loves to hear us bring these things to Him and share them with Him. We need to recognize that we need to pay attention and build a relationship with God. We want more in our lives. We really need more of God. If we want more, then we need to have more of Him because He is the source. He is the source. But He is this very important principle that we can't fail to miss. Cannot fail to miss. To have more of Him, we need less of Say it again. To have more of him, we need less of us. That is who we, we go for. When we seek to have less of us, we are seeking to get our priorities right. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 makes it abundantly clear to us that we should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things that we need will be added to us. But we need to get that priority right. We to have less of us. We need to get the priority order correct. God is first. God come before your children. God come before your spouse. God comes before your parents. God comes before your job. God comes before everything that you can think about. God comes before all of them. There is not one thing that comes before God. Anything you put before God in your priority order, you have just made that an idol. Nothing comes before God. Nothing. As we seek to have more of Him and less of us, we need to submit our wills and our desires to God. Less of us. God, I want to do this, you know, I want that. But I'm submitting this to you because what you want and desire might not be what God wants for you. Yeah? But put it in the context of a car. You find the Honda Civic is the hottest thing that you can think about. You say, yes, that is exactly what I want. But God wants something else for you. God has a Bentley waiting to bless you with. But you all you can see is this Honda Civic. Honda Civic is a nice car. But God wants something different for you. You may want a, a two-seater sports car. And all your effort is going into that. 
But God knows where you're going to be six months from now. And he's trying to lead you in the direction of a minivan. There's a reason for that. God knows what is coming. You don't. Who knows better about how to get more? You are God. Submit our desires to him. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10 says to us, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I like to pray it like this. Your will be done on earth in my life, even as it is in your high and holy heaven. I want to bring it right down to me. I want to submit everything that I am doing to God. To have less of us, we need to submit our wills and desires to God. Does that mean that we become, we become mindless robots? No, it doesn't. God has made us with intelligence, so we think. Does that mean that Christians must now just be mindless robots? The pastor says, do this and do that, and when he goes, yes, pastor. Does it mean that? We have rational minds, we think. We ask questions, we sometimes challenge. We make sure we understand what's going on. We don't just accept things and go with it. That's how lots of people get into trouble. That's how cults form because people do not question and ask a challenge. When the leader of the cult says, bring your teenage daughter. And they just go on carrying a teenage daughter. Are you kidding me? Kidding me? The leaders of several cults, David Koresh, the the man from Waco, a real Waco in truth, right? The man was having sex with a whole bunch of the girls in the cult. And their parents were where? Right there. And they allowed it. All kind of nonsense. They quoted scripture passages, completely mangling the scripture. But the people not challenging because they're not questioning, they're not challenging. They don't take it for themselves. God did not make us to be mindless robots. He gave us intelligence, a will that we can choose. When we choose to submit our will to God's will, that's how we find less of us. Finally, in terms of having less of us, the scripture says to us in James chapter 4 and verse 7, Submit yourselves to God. We do that, we shall do it. Well, we get less of us by doing these things. We want more, but we really need is more of God. To have more of God, what we really need is less of us. Less of us. John the Baptist says it near perfectly. Near the end of his days, John said to one of the disciples, I must decrease. He must increase. John understood exactly who he was and who Christ was. And his time was winding down. John wasn't threatened by Jesus. John knew, I am going before him to prepare the way. I'm letting you know he's coming. He's here, I must now bow out. I must now take my final bow and exit the stage. And John was ready for that. Less of us of him. As we conclude, we remember that God owns it all and desires to give us. We need to receive that. We need to receive him so that we can have more of him and less of us. Let us genuinely seek after him today that we can indeed have more of God by having less of us. Let's start to Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Shatu Kulalat. In the name of Jesus, Father, today we thank you. Let's be a little softer for me. We thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you, O God, that we have a desire to have more. You have given us intelligence. You have given us, O God, a will. You have placed, O God, ambition within us. We desire, God, to have more than where we are right now. 
we are a precious people. Father, we pray that we continually remember that you are our source. Help us to remember and recognize, God, that to have more, we really need more of you. And as we have more of you, we have access to what you have. To have more of you, we need to have less of us. Let self shrink and let Christ be seen in us. Father, let us submit our wills and our desires to you that you can bring to pass in us what you desire for us. God, do it in us. God, do it in us today. Bless us today, Father, we pray. Father, with your people gathered here, we pray that you will extend your hand upon us. God, but we truly will desire to have more. Like Jabez, who prayed, God, that you will bless him indeed, that you will enlarge his territory, that your hand will be upon him, that you will keep him from evil, even so. Even so. We pray that you will give more to us. More. Let there be more in our lives. More for us to give unto others and impart unto others. Let there be less of us seen. And let more of Christ be seen in us in the name of Jesus. Father God, even as John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. Let each of us, O oh God, individually come to that place. Pray that prayer and act that out that we will decrease that Christ may be seen in us. Father, let not our will be done but let your will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. Father, we submit ourselves to you. We give our lives over to you. And pray God that you will give us more in our lives. Bring more into us. Entrust us with more, we pray. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And everyone say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Next Sunday, please God. We continue the more series. We will be looking at more of God from a different perspective next week, please God. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Make sure you don't miss it. More. Say with me, we, we, we want God to give us more. God wants to give you more. more. Let us be responsible and let us position ourselves that God can bring more into our lives and He can use us to bless others. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pronounce the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go with the peace and the blessing of God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Meet and greet each other. God richly bless you. Looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday evening. Be recorded. Be ready.